A.K.A. Gregory D. Stage Where'd name. Where'd you grow up? Uptown New Orleans. Where? Um, around Louisiana Avenue, Parkway, Claymore, General Taylor, Uptown, 12th Ward, you know what I'm saying? Were there musicians in your family? Uh, no, but my father was a, uh, a sports announcer. Yeah. Yeah, for NBC, the champ clock. So he used to do all the fights at the Municipal Auditorium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was the closest as far as everybody else. They just listened to a lot of music. So it wasn't no more musicians, though. What kind of records did you have in your house? Uh, I love answering this question. You mean as far as growing up? Mm -hmm. The music I grew up on was... Like your mom and Parliament, Boosie, Kyle, no brothers and sisters. My brothers and sisters, too. Uh, Paul of Bootsy Collins, uh, Sister Sledge, LTD, Average White Man, Wild Cherry, uh, the Brothers Johnson, the Commodores, Brick, Confunction, the Ohio Players, Heat Wave, the Jacksons. I love you to name you that. <laughs> That's all I like listening to. All the old stuff, cameo, you know, stuff like that. When do you remember first wanting to be a musician? Uh, well, I understand with a musician standpoint, you know, I play drums. So, when did that start? That started like in, in seventh grade. In marching band? You know, listen, I was, uh, as a matter of fact, I started wanting to play drums in like maybe sixth grade. But when I got to seventh grade, I was at uh, Mac May. And, uh, my father took me to uh, McDonald 35 and St. Augustine football game. So I saw the bunch of bands and I just fell in love with St. Augustine's band at the time. Well, I started playing drums at McMain. And once I finished playing drums at McMain, I then went on to James Durham Middle School my eighth grade year because I had an altercation at McMain and I got sent to my district school. Well, I understand McMain taught me how to read music and write music. So by the time I got to eighth grade, I started learning the street fundamentals of playing drums. So I was, you know, pretty much well balanced. But that eighth grade year, my father brought me to the game, the St. All Clear 35 again. And this time, 35 blew St. Augustine out. So at this point, I'm mixed up as far as what high school I want to go to. Well, <laughs> I wind up going to McDonald 35. Once I wind up going to McDonald 35, I started picking up on doing uh, rap music at the time, just, you know, just in my home when players beating on a desk, you know, reciting a couple of rhymes, you know. And I picked up from 9th, 10th, and 11th grade, started getting the, 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 the talent shows and still playing music in the band. And at this time, when I was getting the talent shows out, I, I was in there with a partner called uh, ERC. We had a group called the Rescue Crew, and we had a little chick in there named Tiger P that was also with us. And when we started doing the talent shows... And what did she do? And what did they do? Well, ERC was a rapper, uh -huh. and Tiger P was a, a rapper also. She was our little female that we put there, you know what I'm saying? So. Um, that group we lasted like well, I'm saying maybe about maybe about two three years, and then uh, I wound up hooking up with my, my other partner in the Ninja Crew, which is Sporty T, and me and T hooked up, and uh, we kept doing our music, man. And, uh, so it was maybe 1985 ish. This 1985. Uh -huh. This is 1985, and uh, like, when I got with Sporty. Uh, we start doing the same thing, talent shows, talent shows, winning everything, you know. Um, and who was judging the talent shows? These are gong shows, right? Like, no, you know, well, listen, they would have some talent. You, you know, when you do your talent shows, you have a panel of judges. I guess, I don't know where they pick them from. In high school, you may have four or five, but we do win so many of them. You got first place, you got second place, you got third place. So, I mean, we really never paid attention to who the judges were. Never did, but nevertheless, when I graduated high school, I had a choice. 
in either either uh, going to college or going through scholarships, all on music, you know, play the band because that's what I wanted to do. Go to Southern University, which I had the con I had the scholarship to Southern uh, Florida A and M uh, grant. So I decided to go with the record contract. So we got signed. Uh, we got signed out of a label out of Fort Lauderdale called uh, Foresight Records. It was me, uh, me, my partner Sword and the major crew, Baby T uh, was our DJ. Uh, MC Shy D was on the label. Uh, Jiggle Tony, Brother Marquise from the Two Live Crew when we first started. So that was the first, you know, our first introduction as far as when we actually got on waxing. And it came to be the first, the first ever 12-inch single to ever come out of New Orleans. This is the first time anybody in New Orleans has been on wax. That was a rapper. So this is our first song, Ninja Crew We Destroyed. I see he has everything over here. He has everything I need to put out. Gregor did made it first greatest hits too. <laughs> okay, so let me well, see. Well, so first. Was there just no record label here that could put these things out? I mean, is that why you had a lot of record labels? You had the one out of Denver, you had Florida, California. Why were all of these, um, do you have water? I'm oh, listening. Okay. Um, why, did, why were there so many record labels from outside of Louisiana? There just weren't well, no record labels in New Orleans. Yeah. New Orleans, listen, New Orleans with a lot of music, and still, we get everything less. That's the bottom line. I was, well, you know, it's not the sugar coated. It is what it is, you know. When you leave from out of New Orleans, you know, it's just, it's just I don't know, it's just, it's a, it's a fun city. It's cool. But as far as if you try to get breaks, as far as like, you know, we had our wave when you had the uh, No Limits booming. It was, you know, just New Orleans, and then you had the cash money's booming. I'll tell you what, honey. You know what was so confusing to me? I just wish that with No Limit and cash money were that powerful, that they could have converged together and did a lot of things together because we would have been like Atlanta is. But, you know, it's very hard to get New Orleans artists to work with New Orleans. The same way we, we Hollywood South, though. And that's working out. You know, but as far as we do, you know, you have a lot of togetherness, you know what I'm saying? So. so at the very beginning with Ninja Crew and everything, who were you looking up to? Was there anybody in town? And you guys were so early. Um, you know, who did you look up to in town as an example? Or in did town? You, or did no. you really have to look, you had to look outside of town? No, it wasn't nothing, was nothing in town. I yeah. mean, but, um, I would have to say my earliest, the people I looked up to was Run DMCs. <laughs> Run DMC, uh, as far as rapping, the ones we would respect, you know, you know the Houdinis, uh, uh, the, 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 the LL Cool J's, the Eric B and Rakim's, uh, the Dougie Freshes, you know, as far as your know, overall entertainer. You know, uh, uh, your Teela Rock, your Kumo D's, uh, you know, you just had so many people out there. I mean, you had so many people that that that, that did records that was just music, like uh, A La Na Na Fish, uh, 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 African Band Body, The Soul Sonic Force. You know, don't mean different people. Mm -hmm. you know. Never forget where you came from was the first example of like a word roll call or any kind of, you know, shouting out places in New Orleans on wax. It was the first. Exactly. So, um, did the, I mean, I know later on, Bunk, Buck Jump Time Buck Jump got Time, yeah. banned by a lot of DJs. But what about that first record? No, Never they didn't get banned by DJs. The record got banned by different high school uh, okay. authorities that let the DJs know you can play whatever you want to in this day, but you better not put the Gregory D record on Bug Jump Time. 
that's a that's that's a hell of a anytime the school board can come forward and say, you better not play this record, that's you got a strong record. <laughs> Well, starting with Never Forget, so you, I mean, what gave you the idea? I mean, it had been something that had been going on in Second Lines and Brass Bands and stuff for a while, so you just put it on wax and it just seemed natural. And Let me tell you something. I believe in, I believe in one thing. The reason I can flip the script and still dominate right now at a whole nother level is because I believe in originality. Anything that I do, no matter if I looked up to somebody in the industry when I was coming up, I do originality, I do me. I set, I set the mark. And that's been throughout my whole career. Everybody else wanted to talk about New York, everybody else wanted to talk about LA, and everybody was scared to talk about New Orleans. I didn't have time for that. I'm gonna set the mark. I'm gonna make everybody start talking about the ball. Come on, you know when I do, I drop when I drop. Never forget why it made it cool for you to talk about the wards now nah, in the wards. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, I'm glad a lot of people picked up and they were able to represent where they where they actually come from. But that's what it was for me. You know, I I, I have to stand as as, as, as being a creator and, and, and being real original mm -hmm. because you know that's the only way. You're gonna actually get over the hump in the music industry. You have to be original. Mm -hmm. You know, you want people to identify you as having your own sound. Yeah. Listen, you, it, no matter what Gregory D sounds like, Gregory D. Gregory D on the record sounds like Gregory D. Gregory D on the commercial sounds like Gregory D. I, I mean, and that's just that's just what I thrive on. Do you think you got your, you've got such a recognizable voice, you think you got it from your dad, or is that just something that you, you know did what? you practice? You know have? what, you know what, you know what? I, as, as time went on, I was so young when my father was doing the sports announcing that I didn't realize till I got older that, man, I probably got this from my daddy. It's probably where it came from. You know, because I was, like I said, I was too young when he was doing that. You know, matter of fact, I wasn't born yet when he was doing the sports announcement. So I figured, I mean, I guess it's just the genes, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes it doesn't matter. Exactly, exactly. When did you first meet Manny? Uh, we were all uh, about around 82, 83, 84. Manny was in. Uh, Manny was in another group called the uh, New York Incorporated, right, with Diddy D. And I was in a DJ group uh, called The Rockers Revenge. I was doing some MC for them. And my two cousins, uh, well, my cousin DJ HC and DJ Bird were the DJs. And, and, and Manny, it was Manny, DJ Wop, uh, Mia X. And uh, like I said, it was me, DJ, HC, Bird, Rockers Revenge. We just were DJ groups that just did different parties, mm -hmm. you know. So that's what we basically did. And, and we would always see each other, you know, we would always conversate. So we were pretty cool, you know what I'm saying? I do have some in my water. No, I'm good, I'm good. Okay. Do you remember who did the cover of Throwdown? Who took your pictures? Who did the cover art? Do you remember? Ready for this? I couldn't tell you who did it. I couldn't tell you who did it. a long time ago. Listen, that was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I know okay. you did not ask me <laughs> who took the cover that. I don't know. Matter of fact, shit, no. I mean, I wouldn't know at all who took that cover. I believe it's this one. No, I this way. No, that's the no, reason. That's reason. That's still yeah. out right there. Yeah, I don't know who took that cover. But I know when the picture was taken that, it was right there uh, on the river walk. When they first put the river walk together, they had the waterfalls. Mm -hmm. So we were right there. I remember when I took it though. Yeah. Where were you playing? I mean, first with Ninja <laughs> Crew and then with Manny, where were you performing at? What, what venues? Uh, we were doing. Uh, uh, listen, they were constantly have 
are high school dances. Most most of the high school dances in the city from the St. Mary's uh, to the Abrams to the Xavier Prep dances. So maybe two years after that, they used to always hit uh, dances in the Superdome. Uh, like in the ball in the second level, the ballroom level, which looks like it's more the super loud so. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, different skate rings. Uh, there was a place that was real popular uh, called Three Peas, which was on Claiborne Avenue. It's right next to whenever your car gets told it's under the bridge oh, on Claiborne, but it's a church now. Uh. It used to be called Three Peas, so. A lot of different places like that. You know, back when we was laughing, and then by the time we actually put, and it all depended, because when you say when we first started, it's a little different after you make a record because you move up as far as when you're actually performing that. You know, like when Ninja Crew first came out, we were, you know, basically Louisiana, Cajun Dog, Centriplex and Baton Rouge. The record got pretty hot, you know what I'm saying? It was a learning experience, though. So, and then you gotta realize once I moved up and me and Manny dropped a little more exposure. You know, now you Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Memphis, you know. Did you know it was gonna be as popular as it was? What? Um, you know, well that first record, but then you have three records with him. I mean, you were the most popular Rapper in the West. Uh, I mean, uh, did you could you see it happening, or did it just happen? Seem like overnight? Did it kind of you know you got really really successful? Have, no, could I, you see it happening? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't. Let, let me tell you, I, I, I'll be very honest with you. I take this so serious; it's not a game. If I say I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it. Any rapper that I ever put out, highly you know him. Holly, there's a bunch of rappers that you, didn't even, you don't even know that you're going to find out today that I'm behind. And I, I've never been off the mark with nobody. If I profess that I want to go do this and do that, I just work that hard. You know, and then when you get used to it's the same thing from when you started, when I started playing drums. The best I could be at drums is section leader. You know, I mean, it's who that leads to what? That leads to scholarships. Okay, I want to be a rapper. Okay, let's get in talent shows. The shit started getting like boring because we like just winning shit. But we work so hard, we take it so serious that yeah, I can honestly say, yeah, I mean, when I get into something, I, I, I you know what? I kind of pre play it. I kind of, I kind of pre play it. You want this? Yeah, I kind of. That ain't water. I kind of pre play it ahead of time, you know, eventually actually what I want to do. And I just go at it so hard, you know. You know, if you pre-plan anything and you just do it right, and but but see, it's just a matter of a high hard. Yeah, natural light and beer. You would be the one to bring this. <laughs> <laughs> We're good, thank I'm you. Here's water too. Now you have all the beverages. Gotcha. So go ahead, where was I? Um no, I, I, I understand your point. What about California? Listen. What happened and California situation was throw down album. I just had an idea for a uh, Freddy Krueger record since you know Nightmare on Elm Street was real popular. And by me playing drums, I just I come in this damn beat in my head. I do my thing. Let me tell you, when you can't go wrong, a beat that's gonna never go wrong is boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. That's the national crossover, no matter what. It's never going to fail you. And then I used to always be just reciting that the little girl on Freddie, on Nightmare on Elm Street, when she was going, one, two, Freddie's is coming for you. And I was like, you know what? If we put this ignorant shit behind that goddamn beat, let's see where this is going to go. <laughs> we, put, we put it together. Once we put it together, got in the studio, recorded it. And really, was, it was just a single at first. It was me and Manny hooked up a single at first. And the single wound up going to the album deal with Throwdown. Excuse me. The Freddy's back grew up real good, though. And then it led to the album. 
But by being our first time in the industry, we're making our show money. We're traveling. It was time to get paid the road. As a matter of fact, mind you now, we didn't move to California. And while, while we were in California, we were in a barbershop. This is a funny story on Rodeo. And we left New Orleans and we had been watching the Rodney King trial from New Orleans. When we moved to L.A., we forget that we're in L.A. where the Rodney King situation is going on. So we're in a barbershop, and uh, everybody's tuned in, and everybody's looking, looking. And, you know, you hear people saying, man, God damn, if they find, God damn me, if they find the motherfuckers not, not, not guilty, there's going to be some shit tonight. You know, you know, so I'm like, I'm not really paying it no mind. We're be between recording the album. We get back to the hotel. And uh, I remember this. We were staying at the Hollywood Holiday Inn right now from the Hollywood Bowl in California, in Los Angeles. They found those policemen not guilty. Mind you, me and Manny were the woman. We was having a ball anyway. We were up there, so... We had our, 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 our alcohol. We was having our damn. We had been partying all damn day. I woke up and I think we were staying on like the 40th floor and I had the window open and I was smelling smoke. So <laughs> I got up and walked to the window and I looked out the window and I see. I start seeing all the fire everywhere. I'm like, fresh, bitch. Wake up. Wake up, bitch. So, man, man it was like, Man, what? I said, no, dude, you don't understand. Look at that TV. They just hit that dude in the head and pulled him out of that truck. But that's up here. I said, look out. So, man, he got up, looked outside. Everything burning. Record label had to come move us into Glendale. We had to hold up with recording. We were stuck up there for like three, four months with all the loop going on and shutting down all the studios. So it was an experience of... Uh, we finally finished up the album, put the album out. The album started doing its numbers. We were doing our numbers on our shows. It was time to get paid for this album. From all those Freddie's Black records. We came home and was going back up about a month ago to receive our money. Probably was about. Look at that man, Bob. 150, 175, 175,000 on like the first six month period. This will be our first check. We flew back in. Well, I flew back in to LA because the CEO of the label wasn't answering the telephone. Mm -hmm. So I took it upon my own after about two, three weeks. You want to play games? Okay, I'm coming up there. We flew, I flew all the way to LA. The record company was gone. No, the record company was gone. The building was boarded up. They had changed them, yeah. It was gone. So we never saw this guy again, David Moses. I think he's somewhere in Baton Rouge. I don't know. Hmm. Oh, man, I got some stories for your ass. You don't want talking to me. I'll show you how dangerous this music industry is. Yeah. We don't want to really dwell on all that because my feelings start getting involved and I start calling these motherfuckers out. <laughs> well, go ahead, Holly, what you say now, baby? See, now I'm getting a little loose now. You feel me? So let's talk. What you want to talk about? Um, who'd you look up to as a drummer? Uh, as a drummer, it had to be my partner, uh, Lionel Lee, that taught me. And he plays with the little, uh, he plays with the little brass man. I forgot their names. You know, so they mixed, uh, you know, it's it's it's, it's uh, they're white and black, so I forgot the name, but it's gotta be Lionel Lee. How are rap and brass bands involved? How are how do they influence each other? How is rap been influenced by brass bands? Uh, I never used brass bands. I like brass bands. Uh, I think a lot of, I, mean, I guess some people like to use uh, brass band sounds in their music. I mean, I had never. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so I, as far as I had influenced it, 
that's two different things. They can work together, but I never even thought about how that influences. Mm -hmm. Nah, I don't even want to be on that. What about I'm in my zone. What about buck jumping? I mean, people who aren't from here who see this video, they hear that record not know what it means. What does it mean? Bug jump is just getting into the music, feeling the music, just doing. Really, it's like a second line dance. You know, when you're using your feet, shuffling. Um, usually, see it in the second lines. You know, but I also call bug jump is just just bucking. You know what I'm saying? Motherfuckers wasn't bug jumping when buck jump time come on. When buck jump time come on, motherfuckers is bucking, like bucking all motherfuckers, like. Punching motherfuckers. I don't know where that came from, but I don't know where that shit that kind of like fucked me up because I never said nothing inside the record that said anything about punching anybody. So that kind of like really fucked me up. And like every time we would do that goddamn record, I mean, they were fights. No, I'm not gonna say all the time, but when that motherfucker come on, the crowd would look like ants. I mean, just slam dance and just running around. And I'm like, well, what did I say violent in that record? I said, listen, to the rhymes back to back that I wrote for the project, where I'm like, nothing said, nothing about fighting right there. Uh, this rap is wild. Our number one hit, when you ever heard a rapper bust like this, I didn't hear anything wild in that part. <laughs> but I think what you're triggered it. When I said Uptown, Third Wall, that Cali, yo, Bell for Me, Magnolia, I think they just would be bucking so hard that when they hear their project, you know, and it's listen, even when I say they're talking about California, like it's so dope, let me see Cali walk through the Cali, yo. I'm still not saying nothing about New Orleans fighting against New Orleans. When I said Wild Hood, Wild Hood, New Orleans, Lord, I heard they kicking colors in the same at all because you had Bloods and Crips starting to fall. So I still was trying to figure out myself, okay, where are these fights occurring? So by the time the records start getting like really hot, I just was confused. But like I said, they just get excited when the record comes on. You know what I'm saying? And if, you know, it just makes your adrenaline start flowing. It's like it's like some pre-slam dance shit. By mistake, you know what I'm saying? So, and you know the crazy part? Let me tell you something. It just shows you how records backfire on you. Buck Jump Time never was a record <laughs> that we said this bad boy about to blow up. That shit you not. Man, I didn't even like Buck Jump Time. I'm like, fuck it. I'm recording this motherfucker. We tried it at the concert at the Municipal Auditorium. It was Greg and Dean Manny Fresh, NWA, Sweet T, Rodney and Joe Cooley. So I always test some shit. I was like, I told my wife I said. And, and remember, at that time, everybody was on the Freddy's back and the can't never forget where I come from. So they was waiting for us to do can't never forget. So we did can't never forget. I said, listen, before I go, I said, we got a new song that we gonna do. I remember this shit. We had a new, new week. <laughs> we had a with this auditorium. I put that motherfucker on. And when that bitch went, well, all you sleepy heads out there, it was going, do, do, do. Do, do. And when I fucking said, you know what time it is when that shit went, punk jump time, when that motherfucker started going, boom, 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 boom. I looked at that crowd. The first time, they just, <sighs> and I'm saying, oh my God. So when I finished, I told my partner Brian, we're going to record this. We're just going to throw it out there and see what it do. And let me tell you something, we just threw this out there. That motherfucker backfired and blew up because it's original. And see, that's when you start learning. Anything that you do that's original and don't sound like nobody else, you're going to stand alone. And you brought New Orleans into the rap. Exactly. Thing. Exactly. 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 So what we at? What's happening? What's the next thing? You know, you got used to be taking a whole. You know, I can just talk my ass off. Well, what about bounce? Why did drag rap catch on here so much? I mean, why is it still? What is it? What is it about that record? What is it about bounce? I don't know. I don't know what it is about the record. I just know one DJ probably took it 
and everybody got used to listen. Let me tell you something. It goes back to the originality. It goes back to like right now when a lot of the bouts listen. I'm not knocking none of the bouts. I'm not knocking none of that shit. But a lot of the bouts is hot just in the water. When, when Trigger Man came out, a lot of DJs started following whoever started the situation originally. And it went from this DJ to that DJ to all the DJs. It's the same thing with the bounce right now. Boy, I feel so sorry for the little new motherfuckers that do have good material. Shit, you can't even get in right now. Because if your shit ain't bounced, you know, but that's kind of confusing because... Future still gets played, Richard McQuarrie still gets played, the Amigos still get played, K-Camp still gets played, uh, Young Thugger still gets played, Kendrick Lamar still gets played, Wiz Khalifa still gets played. I don't want to hear all the fucking excuses from these rappers. Get you some original shit and get out there and promote the material. Go back in the days when rap a lot priority was here. When they used to have street teams and posters and flyers everywhere, like with the Rough Riders. I mean, you knew if they came in town, they was in town. Posters everywhere, everything. But you don't have none of that shit no more. You know, you don't have a lot of people with original shit. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so that's just basically it. Talking about Buckshot Tap, why do you think there's always been so much competition between Buckshot Tap and Buckshot Tap? Why do you think that is? Is it because we're at in New Orleans? Mm -hmm. Because, first of all, You got a lot of violence because we already know it's been this way for years. It's always been corrupt. It's always been short on police. That's that's some new shit that they're making up now that they finally, once you see the shit can't be controlled, now you find finally saying we're short on manpower. Shit, you've been short on manpower for like 45 years. And my goddamn eyesight, and like, four, I mean, so, um, uh, and uh, the drugs, you know what I'm saying? Also, you know, I, see, I, I would think a good way to, to stop a lot of crime is to open up more studios. You know what I'm saying? Because all the killers is rappers. I mean, <laughs> give them a studio to record at, they're not in the street. <laughs> That's a parable, you know, you have to really think about. That is some real shit, though. That is some real shit. All the rappers is killers. That's, that's all. I mean, they, they want to put their, listen, all of them want to make sure that they're living that life that they're talking about. Man, don't you forget, this is fucking entertainment. You know, a lot of them get caught up in that and they feel they have to be that person that they, it is what it is. That's going to throw me into a whole other subject. But what you were saying, Ali? What are you the most proud of? From your whole career, the last 10 years to everything, what do you think you're most proud of? Uh, uh, I would have to say, honestly, honestly, I would have to say that the most thing that I'm most proud of would, 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 would be the fact that I was able to become a brand. That's all I can say. I mean, there's a bunch of things I'm, I'm, I'm proud of. It's just the fact that I'm a brand and I'm, I'm still able, you know, to conduct business on different levels in the entertainment field. I mean, that's... And just in case people don't know, you're very, very much in demand as, you know, uh, a rapper and events announcer. You do television interviews. You're on Fox News. Uh-huh. Yep. Give concerts. Mm -hmm. Also uh, promote groups if I like you. You know what I'm saying? My first group I put out, my first artist that I put out was at what, seven, eight years old? Mac. Uh, but you know Mac's in jail still right now. Uh, I put Mac out at eight, nine years old, taught him to rap, uh, wrote 75% of his album. You know what I'm saying? Got him loose, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I need wheels. Then, uh, my partner bus now bought me a demo of Tim Smooth. 
me and my partner Johnny Noah put them smooth out on JG Records. Uh, then I promoted the first debut singles to get Magnoli Chop out there with the What You Wanna Do, Ooh, It's Gonna Be a Hot Summer, Shake Your Body. Then I started my own record label and I put out Bugsy with the Tear This Mother, da, da, da. that's all mine, dude. So I, and you know what, this shit is like crazy because, you know, and, and what I am proud of, I can answer this too to answer that question, is that I could call my own shots. And as far as which way I actually want to go. And it's so crazy because I have a hand in damn nearly everything. And sometimes it's overwhelming because I, I spread myself too thin. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's like this, like well, while we having this interview, we just finished up Mary J. Blige, Biz Marquee, Dougie Fresh. You know, the following week before I was crammed up, me and Scarface was in concert in Baton Rouge the week before. I did Bootsy and uh, Mystical at the Western Center in Denver. As we speaking right now, tomorrow night's me and Trina in Baton Rouge. I mean, this shit's crazy. And that kind of shit is crazy because you not only promoting the concerts, motherfuckers are still calling you like, man, what's the ticket for you to perform? And I'm like, <laughs> shit, you know, I be, I be really on some shit like, shit, you proud of that? You know, not too many people can do that. You know, when rap is over, rap is over. And yeah, let's be realistic here. Holly, do you know I have a fucking hustle so infamous with these commercials and giving concerts and I ain't gonna never stop working. I know that. You know, and you gotta realize that hey, there's no secret to nobody. You know, everybody already know you want a commercial from Gregor D, it's two hundred fifty to three hundred dollars. Do the bad Holly. Fifteen of them a week. Do the bad Holly. That's that's just do the math on that shit. That's crazy. And that's just Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. I'm like about three, four more weeks away from um, uh, sending my commercial company international. The crazy part is I'm like over 2,000 some commercials. I do Jay-Z shit, I do Jay shit, I do Dibble shit. I do everybody's shit without a fucking website. This is fucking crazy. Or Twitter or Without anything all else. No fucking Instagram, no yeah, nothing. The only social. way you can find me, you better know a motherfucker that know another motherfucker that know another motherfucker that know me. And then I'm going to give you my email address. Pay me, partner, at gmail.com. Fuck that. Hmm. This the music industry. This shit that took a toll on me. I want my motherfucking money. I know they ain't going to be able to play this part, but I hope y'all got an R rated part in the Nola Archives. It's all right. We're going to leave it in. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh huh. It's crazy, motherfuckers. But this music industry is aggravating. Dang. You mentioned Tim Smooth. We lost him a few weeks ago. Tell us a story about Tim Smooth. Um, Tim was good, man. Tim was good. Um, um, when Bust Down bought me his demo, man, uh, I, he, he, had, he just had an original sound. Let me show you something. Tim Smooth's DJ was Lil Daddy, right? A lot of people don't know that Lil Daddy is Baby T for the Ninja Crew. I put Baby T along with Tim so that Tim gave somebody to do his tracks because Baby D Change his name to the daddy. He wanted his own identity. I'm like, cool, but he didn't do a thing. So he did the tracks for Tim Smith. So we put, I put the whole, the whole, the whole scenario together. The shit was crazy. Uh, and Tim Smooth's record came out. Um, I got to have it. We started moving so many damn units in Houston. We got the attention of Lil J. So we wind up, bottom line, man, signing this contract over to J Prince. So J Prince bought him out his contract. I mean, he, we was cool. We like, fuck. Shit, I built him. Got him out there, sold a contract. That means that the, if you want to be realistic here, that means that the 7500 that you started off with the budget, and then you might have wound up at fourteen grand, putting behind him, 
but then you add up the fact that you sold over 35,000 records on them. You made sure you took care of them with his royalties, but when boom, boom, then you look at the fact that Len J come and buy the contract out for 80,000. Good luck. Handing your business. You know, and, 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 and it's business. And me, it was, and me and Tim was cool up to like, to like the, you know, but as you know, we started getting a little long cancer, you know what I'm saying? I was back and forth in Houston. You know, still, still we talked to Tim, you know what I'm saying? So that was basically it, you know what I'm saying? I felt good with that, being able to have a hand in this project. You know, because if you notice, Tim Smooth's album was on your records. So from the beginning, it was taken, as once we got behind him, I made sure I brought him over to the label. Got him a deal, you know. That's that is what it is, and you know, I, unless you would have really even asked me that, I sit back in the gap with a lot of motherfuckers don't know. We don't just play the front line with the rap shit, shit, no, man. I was making sure rappers get out there, making sure that their careers get out there, you know. But you know, right now I'm very careful about that because you don't have a lot of loyalty with these rappers. You know, you put all your time, your money, you put all this invested in them. And, and they don't understand that the way they bootlegging right now, it's hard for you to even make any money. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so, I mean, it's, it's just, just kind of hard getting behind these artists because if they don't understand that loyalty, I mean, it can turn out real bad. Yeah. You know, so. No stuff won't be no stuff. No stuff, no stuff. I let y'all, but matter of fact, that came off our, where you from, uh, even with the, Drop and give me 50. When, uh, what's his name out of Houston? Mike Jones. He came on the hook from Tim Wall. Listen, and listen, and that's what, listen, that's what fucked me up about it. If the artist down here, if, if the artist down here, Holly, just go pull together, and they just can pull together, and you see what's going on. Atlanta's just stealing our shit left and right. It's the style, the swag, but they all together. They all working with each other. And it's so hard. I, listen, they got so much violence going on. Right now, this shit is like baby Iraq now, yeah. And it's just hard to even get. It goes back to what we was talking about earlier, man. You can't get them to work together. I mean, but you see the impact. Every time you turn around, you know, somebody's doing something that New Orleans taking our sins on the records. You know what I'm saying? So there's just a whole bunch of different situations. Did your dad live long enough to see you, to see your success? Yeah, you know what? He started seeing it, but he was also, <laughs> he was also, he was a, he was like a preacher. He was like an elder. Like, like, uh, you know, real deep in the church, you know, so, yeah, he was able to see the success. He didn't want to really hear some of the albums. <laughs> I was off the beat rack, you know what I'm saying? But he had, he was able, he was proud of it though, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, he was able to, up until the time too when I signed with RCA, so he still was around. Yep. Yeah. Um, Pre-Katrina, post-Katrina, what was your dad like? From what standpoint? Um, either people working together differently. Oh, we're talking about in New Orleans? Anything. Yeah. Just pre Listen, this is the way I feel. This is the way I feel. You talking about hip hop in general, right, Ali? Yep. See, Ali. Rap and bounce on See, it. Ali. I was good with music pre Katrina. And let me tell you why. And I'm speaking just about the music industry, period. And I can even, and it can fall into the warnings too. Man, they got so much bullshit out there right now. You used to have to really be a rapper and spit some shit to get respect in this industry. You don't even need to be a rapper no more. Now, listen, they on some bullshit right now in the music industry. You know how many motherfuckers can't rap? You know how much shit you listen to right now that you can't understand what they saying? But 
Listen, can't knock them. They got an original style. That stupid shit is selling. <laughs> oh, what the fuck can you get mad at a motherfucker that just sold over two, three million records? That stupid shit is selling. That's how they feed their family. That's how they feed their family. I'm just going to rap in the street. It just ain't the same. It's, it's, it's all political. It's all. It's all political. I mean, listen, you can have a bullshit record. As long as you got some serious money behind you and you got the connects, it's all about who you know, you in. Who's been your favorite artist to work with? Oh. Uh, I mean, what, we're coming on 30 years, already at 30 years. Oh. Uh, I never had to work with no artists. I never, I never did know uh, a, a lot of, a lot of collabos and all that. I would be able to answer that if I was, you know, actually dealing with a bunch of artists mm -hmm. or collaborating with them. You know? What about Mia? Tell us the story about Mia. Mia, cool. Uh, uh, Mia uh, came up with the Rockers Revenge while she wound up getting repeat. You know, she got to break with P and KLC and all the rest of them. You know, you know Mia does her thing. Mia, Mia, like, Mia, Mia, like, real cool. You know what I'm saying? I was, like, surprised. I didn't know up until, like, week before last that she married Scarface. I didn't, I didn't, even, I didn't even know. You know what I'm saying? Until I actually, like, a week before the concert, and I called and I had to get some stuff to bread the face. And I asked him, like, man, you didn't tell me you got married. You in the face. So, you know. Yeah, but she good girl, you know what I'm saying? Mia did her thing, you know what I'm saying? When that no limit, you know, had their situation going, you know? Thank you, sir. That's all good.